Hi, my name is Stacy Goldring. Welcome to Chapter and Notes Book Club. Uh, this month, we're going to talk about Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. I really hope I spelled that name right. Or, I mean, I pronounced that name right. And I do apologize if I botched it because chances are I have. Uh, so I want to talk about this very I call this book a stocking stuffer book. First of all, I love the size. I love anything small. Uh, so I love the size of this book. And I usually don't like hardbacks because I find them cumbersome. But this was just perfection in the size. So good job. Who is it? Pan McMillan. Hanover Square Press uh, for uh, this size because I absolutely love it. Okay. So we're going to talk about this book today. Uh, I'll talk about the reception to the book. Uh, I'll also uh, give you a, a summary. I'll talk about the writing style, give a brief bio of our author, uh, and then uh, kind of go over uh, each of the four, I call them acts, in the book. Uh, if you are a member of Chapter and Notes Book Club, you will have access to our members-only discussion where we go into greater depth about... Uh, each of the characters, the staff, et cetera, and we really hone down. But this is the perfect place for you to be to get that broad overview of this tiny but compelling little book. Uh, and um, also, uh, I have a few little bits and bobs that are very interesting, some other videos that you can watch that are associated with this film, that uh, if you're the type of person who you love to find out that there is a film to go along with a book, well, you've come to the right place. Although, uh, if you speak Japanese, even better. Okay, so actually I'm gonna leave the reception stuff for a while because what I want to do is um, welcome you to the cafe called Funiculi Funicula because that is the name of the cafe that it, at, where all our action takes place. So it's much like a play and keep that in mind. Uh, this cafe was established in 1874 and it's magical, it's a portal. Again, if you're a fan of Harry Potter and that type of, um, of fantasy uh, where we're blending uh, reality with a little bit of magic, then uh, you've come to the right cafe. So pull up a chair, get a cup, uh, and let's go on. So there's this cafe. Uh, we're in Tokyo. It's tucked down a back alley. It's actually in a basement. And every time someone enters, a little bell goes off so people know that uh, a new person is arriving. When you look in the walls of the cafe, there are three clocks. One is telling the correct time. Uh, and um, the there are um, the, there's a ghost. Yes, there's a ghost. There's a ghost who is sitting at, well, actually, she's a hag. And she's sitting at one of the tables and she's she's drinking coffee and she really doesn't interact with anyone. Then we have our characters. So we have three characters who kind of run the place. We have the chef, Nagare. Uh, we have Kazu, who is, uh, the whole story is kind of, uh, is on the fulcrum of, of Kazu. She is the connecting character with everyone. Uh, and then we have, and I'm going to probably pronounce her name wrong as well. And for those of you who read Audible, if you would like, because I, I, I read it, I didn't listen to it. So for those of you who listen to Audible, if you want to leave in the comments the proper pronunciation, you know, just write it phonetically, I'd really appreciate that. Uh, so we have Hirai, who is one of the server. Uh, and then our characters enter the cafe, and so the story begins. So first act enters, we see a young couple, and what are they doing? They're arguing. They're arguing because the guy uh, wants to uh, go to America to work, and the girlfriend, she's not happy. There's a whole backstory on both of them, but she's very upset and they kind of uh, depart with a little bit of, um, they leave the cafe with a little bit of acrimony. Uh, so our second story, we meet a gentleman who comes into the cafe every day uh, and he sits in the back and he's just reading a travel magazine. His wife comes in and visits after work. She's a nurse. And we learn that he is in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. So we have a sweet little story there. The third story that takes place involves two sisters. 
So we have one sister who's the rebellious one who has left her quiet hometown and her family and moved to Tokyo and open up her own kind of little bar. She dresses kind of wild, etc. And we have her sister that comes in every so often who is always, always looking for her. In the last act, we have a mother and daughter interaction that is incredibly poignant. All right. So now we have an idea of uh, what happens in the book. But let me ask you a question. And it is actually a question that is positive in the very, very first pages of the book. And that is, and I wrote in it, so I didn't forget. Uh, if you could go back, who would you want to meet? If you could go back in time, who would you want to meet? Okay. Now, my question to you would be, if you had a chance to go back in time, would you or would you not? And if you would, why? I think this is whole, this is incredibly fascinating. And I also run writing workshops and that may end up in a writing workshop prompt. Kind of excited about that. Okay. So um, in the book, this question is posed to one of every one of the people I talked about in the four acts. Uh, because um, in this cafe, you can travel back in time. Okay. You can go back in time and you can stay there just as long as you're back before the coffee gets cold. Isn't that cute? Okay, so that's the rules. Okay, them's the rules. You can go back in time. There's another rule. You can't change anything in the present. So you can go back in time, but you can't change anything in the present. So now would you? Third rule about going back in time. You can go back in time. You can't change anything about the present. And you can only meet someone who you've met in the cafe. And in this way, the author kind of weaves everything together because now we know with these rules that the interaction between all the characters, at, no one's going to ever leave the cafe, right? No one's going to leave the cafe. And we know that things are going to be resolved or explore with the characters that we see in the cafe. Okay, uh, so... There, there does happen to be uh, another few, uh, another few rules. Is that it's ninety five degrees outside? I don't know if I can make sentences anymore. I usually can't write after two in the afternoon, and I certainly don't speak well after two in the afternoon. And I'm showing you that here in real time because we're looking at uh, well past dinner. All right. So uh, another one of the rules is that. You can only go back in time if you are sitting in the seat where this ghost, this hag, is sitting and sipping her tea, her coffee. She only leaves her seat to go to the bathroom. So in this story, much like in Harry Potter, where you have to suspend certain realities in order to think magically, in this story, uh, ghosts, hags, they need to go to the bathroom. Uh, so people can only sit in that spot and Kazu comes over to pour the magical coffee when the hag goes to the bathroom. And like I said, you cannot uh, stay back in time longer than your sip of coffee. Uh, it is, you can only stay back in time as long as the coffee doesn't get cold. Once it's cold, you need to come back. The reason why the hag is sitting there all the time drinking coffee, because she broke the rules. She broke the rules. So she is now forever in this loop of being in this kind of, she's in the bardo. She is neither back in time, nor really is she in the present. Uh, so uh, she's a very interesting uh, character there. It kind of, well, I hate to make another Harry Potter reference, but I will. Uh, I love uh, when I believe it's um, the prisoner of Azkaban. Is that the one where Sirius dies? I can't remember. It could be the chain. No, I think it is Order of the Phoenix. But it's when he falls through the mirror. I'm so sorry if you if you haven't read that book because now I've told you that Sirius Black dies. But it's it's out now. There's no putting it back. Anyway, he falls through that mirror, and that mirror is like that nether world. That is exactly where I feel the hag lives. Coming back 
uh, to before the coffee gets, I can relate everything to Harry Potter. What can I tell you? Coming back to where the coffee gets cold. So we are in this cafe called the Funiculi Funicula. Uh, and our uh, we have our four vignettes. So what happens in the first vignette or the first act is this young woman, uh, let me get their name straight. First of all, so many of their names started with a K. And since I do not speak Japanese, and this has been translated from the Japanese, I found it kind of hard to remember everyone's name. Ah, let me find my, um. why am I only starting with page three? That's really interesting. Okay, so number one and number two is back here. Great, great, great. Okay, so we have, um, her name is, um, is that right? You know what? I think I messed up some names, but do please forgive me. Uh, I believe her name is Kotaki. Uh, and Kotaki is very angry at her boyfriend, Goro. Uh, so now that he's left the cafe, she want, she comes back and she wants to go back in time because she wants to know why he has left her. Uh, and I think the moral of that kind of vignette is that it's never all about you. Everyone has their own baggage and there's a reason why he has left her. And she needs to understand that in order to evolve. One of the themes of the book is evolving. It's understanding that it is not all about you. It's about, what do they call it? Uh, Self-awareness. She is the least likable Kotaki of all, of all the characters. I wasn't pleased with her at really. She No, I'm sorry. Kotaki, I believe. So sorry, I'm so her name was Fumiko. See, but she has her last name is Kayokawa. So see, so confused. But it, Fumiko is probably the least likable character. So let's now go to Kotaki, who is the nurse. We love her. We love the nurse. So now we're segueing into the second act or vignette. We love the nurse and we love Fusagi because we come to find out that he is reading a travel magazine and writing down all the places that he's gone with his wife so he won't forget. So it's definitely a romantic story. And we also find out he left her a letter, a letter she never read. So she wants to go back in time and learn what was in the letter. And I'm not going to tell you, you're going to have to read the book to find out. One of the weaknesses in the book is we have this letter as this kind of literary choice the author has made, and he uses it twice because the idea of the letter comes up in the last uh, in the last vignette as well. But that's okay because this book has sold over a million copies. So who am I to criticize anyone ever? Because I've written a book and it certainly hasn't sold over a million copies. Okay, so now we go to our third uh, vignette, and that involves uh, two sisters. Hirai, uh, who is that kind of crazy friend that I told you about, and then we also have her sister, Kumi. And Hirai, like I said, has left, and she uh, is living in Tokyo, just having a grand time, uh, wearing all kinds of outlandish clothes, and living her independent, hippy-dippy life and her friend her her sister kumi is always coming into the cafe looking from her looking for her and here i like hides from her in the back and things like that she wants not like she's I think the term she's ghosting her she wants nothing to do with this woman well on one of kumi's visits to tokyo in search of her sister uh, she also has a letter for her and come to find out as she's driving home from Tokyo, she gets in, she's involved in a fatal car accident. Here I is, is, is crushed. So she wants to go back in order to uh, find out uh, what was in the letter and what her sister wanted from her. It's, inc- it's in an incredibly sweet story. And I think it is Hirai who really comes full circle and evolves the most because she was the most rebellious child and she ends up being the most traditional in the end, down to her clothing and uh, her life's path, which I won't tell you because um, I haven't really given well, I kind of give in your way, but some things you're just going to have to read for yourself. Finally, we arrive at the fourth and most poignant vignette in the book. Uh, and that involves, and I'm I'm so sorry, please forgive me, uh, but earlier uh, I called um, uh, one of the um, 
Uh, Kai, I believe I may have called her Hirai, but Kai is our server. So in the restaurant, we have Nagari, who is the sh chef, I mean, the cafe. Uh, we have Kazu, who's always pouring, always pouring the, the coffee for everyone and giving out the rules. And then we have Kai, who is the waitress, the server. And Kai and Nagari are married. Kai has a heart condition. And she uh, decides to get pregnant, with which puts her life at great risk. So in this last vignette, she comes to... I don't want to give much of this away. And it it was kind of confusing in, in the in-person discussions that I have, and even one of the um, online discussions that we had for our members. It was kind of confusing how this particular vignette plays out. And I think every what everyone suggested they're they're all right they're all fine because we can read whatever we want into the book uh but in this case uh she she makes this choice and has to live her life with the consequences of making this choice her husband leaves it leaves it up to her so she decides to go back in time because she wants to she wants to meet her child at a certain age should she not survive childbirth by some fluke she goes back to the wrong time to meet her nonetheless things do work out and she does she she does come to terms uh, with her choice without giving it too much away there. Uh, and even though this book was written by a male, I think he does a very good job uh, of tapping into those choices, the, the difficulty we all have in making certain choices, uh, both good and both bad. And I think he does a great job with that. Okay. Uh, so the name of the daughter, by the way, is Mickey or Mikey. I'm not sure. M-I-K-I. -I. Uh, what's interesting, and I I believe I told you at the start, but if not, I'll tell you now. We have these four vignettes that stand on their own, but they're also connected. They're woven together through Kaza. And also in each chapter, there's kind of an Easter egg in each each act that helps tie the story together. And we come to find out that the daughter actually appears in an earlier vignette that Nagare, her father in the future, uh, he uh, he gets to meet her or in the past, depending on how you look at it. You know, time bending is always kind of woohoo. Uh, but we do get to meet her earlier, which is very fun. And the same thing happens throughout the book. I keep going like this because it's very woven. Uh, it's kind of like a gentleman in Moscow light in the way he weaves everything together. Oh, does he weave? Okay. So uh, that is kind of a convoluted, but very excited way to tell you about uh, the summary of this book. I keep using the word act or vignette, and I do that come to find out because our author was a playwright before he was a book author. And he also explains in one of the few interviews that I found on him that many Japanese authors start out as playwrights. Uh, so he explains that he had to add a little more meat to the story once he went from the playwriting style of writing to the um, to writing a novel. Uh, and once you understand that you're reading a book written by a former playwright, it makes sense because you can see the whole thing on stage because it takes place on one set for the most part, except for the flashbacks of a few of our characters. Uh, but it's right there. And I would love to have seen this as a play. I think it would have been great, particularly because throughout the book, uh, there's a bell that rings when people come into the cafe and it's uh, written throughout the book. And it's just so fun. Every so often you hear, I think he writes, it's clang gong or clang dong. And, you know, it's kind of like freeze or uh, what's going to happen next. I, it's a it's a lovely uh, writing element uh, or style choice that works perfectly, I believe, in uh, playwriting, too. So that that comes through very well. OK. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about 
uh, the reception of this book. Some people felt it was kind of sappy. Other people loved it. But look, it has sold millions. So, you know, forget what the... Re- I, I can't stand reviews. I can't stand lists. I can't stand awards. It. I, I don't have time for it. Uh, but with millions sold, it speaks to some people. It harkens back to the Red Notebook for me. If you read that with our book group by Anton Lorraine, which was a book translated from the French... I do like his writing style better, even though it's it is translated. Realize we're not we didn't read uh, the Red Notebook in in French. I wish I could have, and we didn't read this in Japanese. So we're it's so tricky when you're you're in the hands of the translator. It's so like you really got to trust these people. Okay, so with that in mind, I do want to go over. Um, a, a few of the themes of the book. Uh, well, I'll go over all of them for you because uh, here's what I found. Tiny book, big themes. The intricacy of human relationships, the acceptance of life's impermanence and acceptance of change, the search for self-realization, the search for closure. We all do this. And of course, these more universals, uh, dealing with love, regret, reconciliation, second chances, grief, struggle, and finding meaning in your life. Uh, uh, The names of the chapters are very basic. The lovers, husband and wife, the sisters, uh, mother and child. So very straightforward there. Uh, You will find links below to two two very fun items. One is the trailer for Cafe Finicula Finiculi or Finiculi Finiculi, I can't remember. And we all know what a finicular is, you know, going up and down, etc. cetera. Uh, if you don't speak Japanese, it doesn't matter because now I've told you about the book. So you'll be able to pick out the characters. It looks very sweet. Although some of the reviews said too sweet, too sappy. I've also linked to, I think it's Pan McMillan, who's the, the big, um, Publisher here, let me just uh, I'm gonna check real quick. Hanover Square Press, which is an I'm sure an imprint of something or other. I don't know, it's not here, but I think it was Pam McMillan where I picked this up. Uh, but it is an interview with the author. It he is it's adorable. It's adorable. You need to watch it, but I will tell you this: the book has autobiographical elements to it, and he found a system and he's keeping with it. Can't knock him for it. So if you did like this book, there are more to follow. There is, okay, so we have Before the Coffee Gets Cold. Then we have Before We Forget Kindness, Before We Say Goodbye, Before Your Memory Fades, and Tales from the Cafe. So you can have the whole series. They're all kind of colored differently, but they all have the same style. Uh, if you're a cat lover, there is a cat that appears on the cover of every one. But my God, for life of me, I do remember a cat in the book. I have no memory of the cat in the book. And I wish I had time to reread it, but that's never going to happen. So if you did find the cat in the book, if you could leave in the comments below what page it was on maybe so I can go back and look just so I don't think I'm losing my mind. Uh, I would, I would really love that. I'd appreciate that. And Oh yeah, please do the YouTube things. I'm sorry if I didn't remind you at the beginning, like, like subscribe, hit the notification bell. Uh, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. It's, it's such a short book. I read it in like two sittings. It really, it's nothing. It, it's nothing to get through. Uh, and uh, we're we're reading this in the spring of 2024 with so much going on in the world. It was kind of like having like Sherbert. It was just refreshing. It was just something refreshing. And Lord knows we need something refreshing, something magical. So I, I will recommend to you uh, this book uh, before the coffee gets cold. You know, for my serious readers, it was it was eh, meh for them. But for most people, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed the break. And I don't and I don't blame them. And it's for that reason. So uh, if you do speak Japanese, uh, maybe you can get access to the film and watch it. I'm sure it'll be worth it. It looked absolutely adorable. If uh, I watched something on Netflix recently that was also adorable, but I can't remember what it was. But I believe it 
was it Japanese? I can't remember. Like I said, it's too hot. It's too late. I'm just so glad I got this recording done. We do take a hiatus for the summer. So I wanted to get this out to you. Please send me your recommendations uh, for uh, books. That's that's how we broaden our minds is reading things we really wouldn't read on our own. That's what the book club is about. And don't stop yet. Just give me two more minutes of your time. Uh, I appreciate those of you who are members of the Chapter and Notes Book Club because your membership supports my nonprofit work. So our talking about stories actually helps me document real historical stories. You can go to searchingforidentity.org and you can check out my nonprofit work. And you can also check out my documentary, Traces, Voices of the Second Generation. So um, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion, the brief overview, and my thoughts of uh, Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. So fun. And if you'd like to support a local bookstore, you can order your books through San Marco Books and More, and they ship worldwide. And a portion of every uh, book sold, if you mentioned chapter endnotes, uh, the store donates uh, donates a portion of every proceeds to Searching for Identity. So it's all about loving stories telling stories, discussing stories, in order for me to capture stories, historical stories. Uh, So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time.